Throughout human history, indeed throughout even prehistory, natural landscapes with unknown depths have been described as hungry and as devouring those things which both enter into those depths and do not return. Thus Homer, in the epic poem The Odyssey, describes the ocean's depths as a lightma, or gullet. And thus the character of Lysander in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream describes strokes of lightning as being devoured by the jaws of night, an event which explains their brevity. And likewise, in the second book of Samuel, chapter 18, verse 8, the forest or jungle is ascribed a similar appetite, as it is written that on that day, the woods devoured more people than who fell by the sword. This lattermost idea of the jungle or the forest as some hungry entity that devours all who enter its depths has enjoyed embellishment by both colonial literature and contemporary horror, and it is one upon which we will seize when designing today's adventure. Welcome to PhD in D, everyone. I'm Dr. Bowers, and today we're going to discuss the Ravenloft domain of Valachan, and also sketch out an adventure set therein. Per my usual Ravenloft domain videos, we're going to begin by sketching an overview of the domain, as well as citing some media that will help us get an imaginative grip on this domain, and then we will sketch out an adventure set in this domain. In this case, the adventure takes place over the course of five acts, and takes PCs from level 6 up to level 11. That is to say, the PCs will complete the adventure while they are level 10, and at the adventure's conclusion they will reach level 11. So let's get started. What is the domain of Valachan? Well, an uncharted, jungle-draped island wreathed in mist, Valachan regularly and constantly hosts a bloodthirsty contest. In this contest, called the Trial of Hearts, the ruler of Valachan, a were-leopardess, who can turn invisible at will, named Chakuna, hunts down and kills whatever adventurers may be so unfortunate as to trespass. In accordance with the rites, when Chakuna kills another contestant, she devours that contestant's heart. She, in turn, can only be defeated if a brave group of contestants can find the hidden location of a labyrinth called Yaguara's heart, penetrate its depths to the very center, and then, at the very center, devour Chakuna's heart. In so doing, they would certainly defeat the Dark Lord of the land, but at a hideous cost. The contestant, who assumes victory, would also assume the place of the Dark Lord, and forever preside, as the previous Dark Lord did, as champion amongst the Trial of Hearts. Thus, in the accursed, bloodthirsty Trial of Hearts, there is defeat, even in victory. Now, the domain of Valachan features two very interesting storytelling tropes, especially from the perspective of horror fiction. The first of these is the idea that the jungle is alive and hungry, and maliciously devours explorers who would dare enter its depths. The second idea is that of the most dangerous game, or this idea of a humanoid hunting other humanoids for sport. These two tropes are combined in the Ravenloft domain of Valachan, for what it essentially is, is a dangerous anthropophagic jungle, that is a jungle that eats people, in which all who would attempt to survive find themselves hunted by a camouflaged predator. It's a really fascinating domain for an adventure, and in the interest of doing it justice, let's talk about some media which can help us get an imaginative grip on this domain. First, and perhaps most obviously, is the 1987 action sci-fi horror film Predator. Yes, we do have to mention this, even though it was perhaps obvious. This film famously features a group of US mercenaries, played by action Hollywood stars such as Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers, attempting to perform a routine mission in a South American jungle when they find themselves hunted by and outmatched by a camouflaged alien monster. Just as the domain of Valachan features PCs getting hunted by a camouflaged were-leopard, so does this film feature Arnold Schwarzenegger and company being hunted by a camouflaged alien. Alien. Furthermore, this film features a trap-setting and trap-building montage which should inspire us when we incorporate trap-building and setting into our adventure later. Now, while this film isn't perfect... Oh, my team always works alone. You know that. Well, there's three of you. You're not exactly lone. It is going to form a substantial narrative base for the adventure that we're going to outline later. 
A second bit of media which can serve as an imaginative grip for Valachan is the long story or novelette by Algernon Blackwood called The Willows. This short story is of course not perfect, but if you're looking for rich poetic descriptions of jungles and of nature and of plant growth specifically, which make the very phenomenon of plant growth horrific, you should borrow from this story. There are certain passages about the hideous obstinacy with which plants persist in their natural environs. It is a great source of spooky descriptions of just the jungle or the forest as a natural phenomenon. And on that topic, I would also recommend the 1972 film by Werner Herzog, Agura, The Wrath of God. This film is actually a narrative subversion of much of the fantastic colonial jungle literature from which one might casually borrow in sketching out a Valachan adventure. Instead of depicting a fantastic lost world or dark continent that's ripe for the reclaiming by European colonizers, Agura depicts the jungle as utterly hostile and alien, in a way which simultaneously depicts the horrors of the jungle, as well as the folly of those who would deign to conquer it. And on the topic of violence and conquest, I must also recommend the 2008 horror film The Ruins, based on a novel of the same name. While this film may fall short of certain contemporary cinematic standards, my team always if you treat this film and this novel as a description of a Dungeons & Dragons encounter, it is absolutely amazing. There is a monster in the ruins, which is a very creative monster encounter. <laughs> and we are going to lift it straight from the text into our adventure. And finally, an honorable mention might go to the HBO series Mil Comils, or A Thousand Fangs. This is a series which appears to borrow heavily both from Agura, The Wrath of God, as well as Predator, as well as The Descent. It's kind of like The Descent, except for instead of a group of women descending into caves and getting assaulted by monsters there, it's a group of mercenaries descending into the jungle and getting assaulted by similar monsters there. Again, I only saw the first episode, but it seemed like the sort of media which could help one get an imaginative grip on Valachan. So, with that being said, let's sketch out the adventure. Our adventure takes place over the course of five acts, and PCs will begin at level 6, going up to level 11 at the very conclusion. Our setup for the adventure is the following. The PCs have, for whatever reason, become crew members on a sailing ship. They, along with nine other NPCs, comprise the crew. And here, I think it's a very good idea to prompt the players to name the ship and name the other nine nine crewmates. You could also have the players decide who's the captain, who's the bosun, etc. Don't foist a whole lot of homework onto the players when you do this. Try to make it a light and fun exercise, preferably the sort of which that makes your players attached to whatever characters they just made up. These nine other NPC crew members are going to be lost, and most of the adventure is going to consist in the PCs trying to track them down. In addition, both at the outset of the adventure and throughout its narrative course, dungeon masters might want to take note of which which PC seems most inclined to call the jungle a home? Which PC, in other words, is most likely to be seduced by the idea of ruling Valachan in the place of its Dark Lord, should the Dark Lord be defeated? And yes, over the course of our adventure, the Dark Lord will be defeated. Now, in the first act of our adventure, the PCs wake up to find their ship has wrecked in the jungle. Not only has it wrecked in the jungle, but the ship itself has been split into pieces and now hangs in shambles up in the jungle canopy. Assuming they gather their bearings and safely climb down, besting whatever obstacles lie in their path, they find themselves in Act 2. In this act, the PCs encounter a hole in the ground, out of which they can faintly hear the helpless cries of another crew member. But should they climb down, and we assume they will, they discover it is an ambush, not by a humanoid or even by any animal, but by a horrific plant monster, a body taker plant. In Act 3, assuming that they escape from that horrific encounter, the PCs discover an abandoned ancient city. The vandalism on whose desecrated walls tells a story of what Valachan is, and who Chakuna is, and why the PCs are being hunted, and why their crew has disappeared. In Act 4, the PCs continue to brave both ambush and trap in order to finally encounter Pantara Lodge. And once they thoroughly explore its depths, they come face to face with Chakuna herself. The Dark Lord Wear Leopardess issues a grisly challenge. Best her in the winding depths of Yaguara's heart, and they shall go free. 
And there, in the stony jungle labyrinth known as Yaguara's Heart, our final chapter, Chapter 5, takes place. Assuming the PCs prevail, one among them must stay behind, forever cursed to become the next predator, the next bloodthirsty hunter who rules over Valachan as presider over the Trial of Hearts. And thus our adventure will conclude. Now, our adventure begins with the PCs regaining consciousness aboard the deck of their ship, only to discover two things. First, that their ship is split up into three pieces, and second, that those pieces hang suspended up in the air, up in the canopy of some humid, hot jungle. And here we are going to use the map of Wreck of the Star Goddess from page 85 of Tomb of Annihilation. It is a lovely map, and also a dramatic piece on which to open our adventure. The lowest piece, the stern, the front of the ship, hangs some 55 feet up in the air. The middle of the ship is some 70 feet up in the air, and the final rear section of the ship is 80 feet up in the air. As the adventure begins, let the PCs be split up amongst those different portions of the ship. They are still armed and their equipment is still intact, and we can even be so generous as to say that the PCs enjoyed the effects of a long rest while unconscious, so that all their abilities are ready to go and they have all their spell slots, etc. As they regain their bearings and talk amongst themselves about how to both get down and unite with each other, either a pair or perhaps a trio of hidden displacer beasts attack the PCs. These displacer beasts are actually servants of Chakuna, and they are testing the PCs' metal. Assuming the PCs prevail against the displacer beasts, and somehow find their way down to the jungle floor, they are immediately attacked by two zombie plague spreaders. And there are two things worth noting about these zombie plague spreaders. The first is that, by their countenance and by their clothes, they can be identified as two of the missing crew members. The PCs, after all, woke up without any other crew members. All of the other nine NPCs are missing, now they have found two of the missing nine, but both of them are zombies, and what is more, this is the second thing to note about them, their chest cavities are ripped open, and they are missing their hearts. Assuming the PCs best the zombie plague spreaders, and then conduct some survival checks or investigation checks, the PCs will find some tracks leading down an animal trail through the jungle wilderness. They should seem to be the tracks of the missing crew members. Now numbering in seven. As the PCs make their way down that animal path, they level up to seven, and we proceed to Act 2. In Act 2, as the PCs follow the tracks of their former crew, they come across a hole in the ground, some 20 feet wide and 200 feet deep. The PCs can, if they listen intently, perhaps with a perception check, hear the faint and plaintive calls of another crew member. The calls are faint and repetitive and do not change in response to inquiries or calls back. They simply call for help, say they are trapped, and need help. If the PCs discover some way to go down into the 200-foot depths at the bottom of the hole, they find an elliptical chamber, one which is 40 feet long and 30 feet wide, and blooming with red, orange, and yellow flowers despite the darkness. Ten of these flowers are actually tri-flower fronds per Tomb of Annihilation's monster appendix. And at the very end of the chamber, across from where the PCs came down, there is a burrow into a similarly sized chamber, from which the PCs who descended can now hear the missing crew member's calls louder. Now at this time, the tri-flower fronds, which are in the fore chamber, are not going to attack the PCs. They're going to wait until the PCs try to escape. So assuming that the PCs head into to the second chamber down the hole, they encounter no obstacles. Now in that second chamber, the PCs discover that the cries from the missing crew member are not coming from that crew member at all, but from a body taker plant. Indeed, just as they approach the center of the second chamber, the body taker plant should produce a podling who looks exactly like the crew member whose voice the PCs heard, except of course the podling is naked, covered in mucus, and immediately attacks the PCs screaming. The PCs might notice erstwhile that at their feet lie the clothes and equipment of the missing crew member. At that point, battle breaks out, not just between the PCs and the body taker plant and the podling, but also with five triflower fronds that are in the second elliptical chamber. Assuming the PCs defeat those foes, they are then attacked by the ten triflower fronds in the four chamber on their way out to try to climb out of the hole. Once the PCs make it out of the hole, they should then be able to notice some new tracks with a survival or investigation check. Tracks which they did not see before, but which nonetheless conform to the pattern they would expect from the missing now six 
crew members. They lead further down another animal trail. Assuming the PCs follow, they level up to 8, and we continue on to Act 3 of our adventure. In Act 3, at level 8, the PCs continue down an animal trail and eventually encounter an ancient, ruined, overgrown, abandoned city. The city is uninhabited, of course, except by monsters. And we are going to use the Map of Nangalore from page 76 of Tomb of Annihilation, with a couple of changes. First of all, we are going to double the number of monsters that can be found in this place of each type, as described in the accompanying text for this map. At level 8, that should be appropriate. 8 crocodiles instead of 4 crocodiles, 2 medusas instead of 1 medusa, etc. We are also going to add a dead crew member to area 4, and we are going to stipulate their heart has been torn out. It was, in fact, like the crew members who became plague spreader zombies, torn out and eaten by Chakuna. And finally, and most importantly, Importantly, we are going to change the lore of the place specifically by altering what the statues depict and what the vandalism on them depicts as well. As written, the map of Nangalore features monuments to a certain general, and those monuments are vandalized by a former deposed queen who views the general as having betrayed her, both romantically and militarily. In our reskin of the area, however, we are going to change all of the statues and monuments so that they are statues and monuments monuments which glorify the former Dark Lord of Valachan, a vampire werepanther named Baron Uric von Karkov. The statues and monuments glorify Baron Uric, but of course they are shattered, vandalized, and defaced. The person who vandalized them? Chakuna herself. The vandalism, furthermore, tells the story, both of her conquest and ascendancy to Dark Lord, as well as the nature of the domain and the PC's status therein. Chakuna's graffiti gloats about how she ate the heart of Baron Uruk von Karkov, how she bested him in the Trial of Hearts, and how forever all those who would violate the sanctity of this realm will face her in a similar Trial of Hearts, in which the hunters hunt each other, and only the supreme amongst hunters can reign. She vows that she will reign forever, that no one will ever eat her heart for it is hidden, but she will eat the hearts of all others. This is an optimal place for DMs to just deliver exposition about what this place is, what Valachan's ultimate nature is, what Chakuna is trying to do, and really the character of the adventure. Now once the PCs thoroughly explore this map, and only once they explore this map, can they find additional tracks. Tracks of the remaining five crew members leading down an animal trail further into the wilderness. Assuming they follow it, they level up to 9 and we proceed to Act 4 of our adventure. Act 4 begins along the animal trail, with the PCs being ambushed or attacked by a corpse flower. This corpse flower is holding or digesting three corpses, and upon its defeat, the PCs can find that those three corpses bear the clothing or the partially digested threadbare clothing of three of their former crewmates, except for, as with the previous crewmates' corpses, they are missing their hearts. To balance the corpse flower encounter and make the monster sufficiently challenging, I would add a gaggle of man traps as minions. By now, there are only a couple of crew members unaccounted for, and following this initial battle, the PC should be able to find those two crew members' tracks leading down an animal trail, which will eventually take them to Pantera Lodge. Now, although as written, Pantera Lodge is a series of interconnected tree huts up in the canopy, we are going to use the maps from pages 147 to 155 of Ghosts of Saltmarsh, specifically the Hermitage. I believe it's for the adventure Tamarat's Fate. And we can say that the upper and lower floors are separated amongst the trees, much as the PC's own ship was when it was split and separated amongst different heights at the very beginning of this adventure. So we're going to use the map of Hermitage, but we're going to change the sea hags and other monsters into trained displacer beasts, and we're going to fill the rooms with weapons and hunting equipment and trophies instead of nautical equipment and sailing stuff. We will also let the PCs find some healing equipment, finally, as well as a map of Valachan. You can in fact give them the map that can be found in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Finally, and most importantly, you should allow the PCs to find the Diary of a Dead Adventurer. Maybe it's the Diary of Van Richten himself. And this diary contains detailed directions for constructing a trap that can catch and maybe even facilitate the destruction of Chakuna herself. 
We are going to use the char grilled trap from page 100 of the Nord game book Treacherous Traps, really fun book, and we're going to say that in order to assemble this trap, the PCs need the following bits. A lure, or something that Jakuna would be attracted to, a catapult mechanism, we're going to say that the trap is mechanical rather than magical, a flammable adhesive, and a spark. The idea is that Jakuna will go towards the bait, trigger the catapult, which will in turn fling a flammable adhesive on her, and then she'll get lit on fire and won't be able to rub it off and it'll kill her, or at least incapacitate her. That's what the diary says, and the PCs, by reading it, get a little quest. Now, as the PCs explore the map, which we're adapting from Ghosts of Saltmarsh, we're going to replace the survivors in Area 25 with just one of the two missing crew members. When the PCs find this one missing crew member, they are bound, and when they are freed, this crew member is going to rave and rant about a half-woman, half-leopard who ambushed and captured all of the crew, and who has been selectively letting them go, one at a time, into the jungle in order to hunt and kill them, and then coming back with their heads or their body parts as trophies and gloating. This crew member, by the way, is inconsolable. They will kill themselves as soon as possible. As soon as they do, or when they do, or when the PCs at least deal with that situation, they will hear a noise from Pantera Lodge's highest point, the roof of its uppermost building. This is Area 23 on the map. Assuming the PCs ascend to that location, and this is true regardless of whether they've explored it yet, they could be coming back to it after all, they will find Chakuna in her hybrid were-leopardous form, ripping out the heart of the very last crew member, Mortal Kombat style, as she tosses the heartless body over the edge of the rooftop and munches greedily on the heart. She greets the PCs and informs them of their status. They, she claims, have impressed her with their abilities, and she now formally invites them to participate in the Trial of Hearts proper in the center of the labyrinth called Yaguara's Heart. She points out how to get there on the map, and laughs before retreating. She will, of course, tell the PCs that it's their only way out. She will promise that if they can defeat her in Yaguara's heart that she will grant them freedom, although she's concealing a certain price that comes with it. And if, per absurdum, the PCs attack Chakuna right there and then, she will rip open her chest cavity and reveal that she has no heart, and therefore that the PCs cannot defeat her, not yet, only in Yaguara's heart, she repeats, and then retreats. And here, for the sake of roleplay, I would try to portray Chakuna as one a sporting chance. She viewed all the other crew members as appetizers in a big banquet. Killing the other crew members, in other words, was no sport, but she expects sport from the PCs. Now, at this point, obviously, once Chakuna leaves, Act 4 concludes, the PCs level up to 10, and we continue to the final act, Act 5. Now, in Act 5, the PCs are tasked with traveling from Pantera Lodge to Yaguara's Heart, and if you look at the map of Valachan, those two locations are separated by considerable distance. Therefore, there's a hike that begins this act. I would encourage DMs here to be judicious about whether to have a fast travel over to Yaguara's heart, where you just say several days later, etc., or whether you treat it as a hex crawl through the jungle. If DMs choose the latter, I would advise taking random encounters from the random encounter table in the Valachan entry from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. I would simply caution to remove the dinosaur encounters, because in my opinion, those are just silly. When I think about fighting dinosaurs, I think about whimsical comic book silly action, and here we want to portray the jungle as horrific and scary. Maybe that's just my taste, but I want to flag those couple of entries in the random encounter table. Now, it's true that Yaguara's heart is described as a labyrinth, and that is a very fun sort of setting, but I do not think exploring labyrinths is a very optimal way of playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. I've got a whole video on it, link in the doobly-doo, so I would just describe the PCs as being initially faced with a series of winding hallways. They can make some intelligence or investigation checks in order to navigate their way in, and once they navigate their way in, we have a more traditional dungeon proper. Now, when it comes to the interior of Yaguara's heart, I would use the map of Kale Morrow from page 125 of Call of the Netherdeep. Now hear me out! Hear me out. We're going to change this considerably. First of all, and most importantly, we are going to change all that blue stuff, which is originally water and can only be traversed with a swimming speed, to thick, tangled jungle greenery, which can only be traversed with a climbing speed. We are going to, of course, change all of the monsters into random encounters from the table in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft for Valachan. We are going to describe all of the rooms as ruins, and all of the NPCs will be dead and rotted away. They 
are old adventurers who died in this place. But we will also allow the PCs to find the various bits for the trap in these chambers. Finally, we are going to replace the Elixian Abolith with a Relentless Juggernaut from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and we are going to give it a climbing speed of 40 feet, and replace her charge attack with the ability to cast Invisibility on herself. She can do this at will, it's not limited to a number of times per day, by the way. The bludgeoning damage from her punch attacks we will reflavor as slashing damage from claw attacks. And that's going to be our Chakuna. Assuming the PCs travel about these chambers and they assemble their trap, they should be able to light her on fire and then do so much damage to her that she's a burnt up, shriveling, broken wreck on the floors of the ruins of Yaguara's heart. At that point, she laughs and tells the PCs that if they want to finish her, they need to travel to the center of this labyrinth. And there, at the very center of the labyrinth, we can have Chakuna's heart pulsing on a pedestal. As though it were alive and bleeding, it pulses. And here, I think it would be ideal to have, for the entire adventure built up to this, by the way, and aim at a kind of sub-optimal resolution. As Strix describes in her interview with Really Dicey, Link in the Doobly-Doo, there's a really fun thing that you could do here, where one of the PCs feels an overwhelming temptation, perhaps an urge, to stride forward forward and eat Chakuna's heart. Once they do so, they rip out their own heart, put it on the pedestal as though under an enchantment or compulsion, and then they ascend to the status of Dark Lord of Valachan. The entire land warps and twists in order to meet the new lord's expectation of what an ultimate contest should consist in. In the midst of the transformation, perhaps the other PCs have a chance to escape, and we should treat that event as the concluding event of this adventure. And that's our adventure in Valachan. What do you think? Did it sufficiently invoke an idea of jungle horror? Is there anything that you would add to it? What about the monster choices? Or perhaps you have other ideas about media to help us get an imaginative grip on this domain. Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to do all the internet things. Click like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon if you want notifications on the new content I upload onto this channel. And stay tuned for more videos. Thanks very much.